My name is Michael Wood. Since the age of 17, I have been willing to die in service to my community. In the U.S. Marine Corps, I was Sergeant Wood. Michael Wood spent 11 years in the Baltimore Police Department. Before Michael Wood is a very honest uh, individual. He was not liked by the Baltimore City Police because he didn't play the good old boy network game. As my career developed, I set out to understand why people offend instead of how they offend. The reason why these consent decrees don't do anything is because there's no enforcement or changing of the mechanism of incentives for the officers. So all you're doing is talking about it. You're certainly was going to cross. I was ready to shoot if I had to, but I was never going to cross that line. But you kind of wanted to shoot. Sure. What? Get what you inspect, not what you expect. Mm -hmm. So or anywhere that's populated is your metric is based off of arrest. So you don't actually go out and engage with the community because that would be time that you could be getting the arrest that you're expected to get to prove that you're a decent officer. So you actually don't have any incentive to communicate. Michael, we should be looking for goals to not have people end up in the criminal justice system. Instead, every solution we have is to push them into the criminal justice system. Which it should not be up to Jeff Sessions to determine how Baltimore Police Department operates. It should be up to the residents of Baltimore. Jeff Sessions doesn't know anything about policing, never has and never will. I want to read a quote uh, that you gave the Washington Post, which struck me. You said, when you work in policing, you're inundated early on with the us versus them mentality. It's ingrained in you that this is a war. And if someone isn't wearing a uniform, they're the enemy. It just becomes part of who you are, of how you do your job. What I'm trying to say is, is that we are looking at people who are doing nothing new. And if we focus on the actions, then we can fix the things for next time. Because when you focus on people, we end up thinking we can chop the head off. They put a new person in and something will change. But if we don't focus on the methodologies look, look, and the institutions, somebody, then we will be put them totally in a, in a prison moment. cell, do the paperwork, go back out and do it again. So what we really need is to change the incentives and disincentives so that no matter what the role, we're still going towards that objective There's that actually serves occupation, you. More vehicles if your answer continues to be violent because we have to understand that everything about policing is inherently violent. I have come in there with authority and told you what you will do. I was hoping to start off with the Joe Arpario thing. Yeah, uh, why don't we just start with that? All right, you tell me when you're ready. I'm ready, just go. So in today's Washington Post, in the national security section, and why I can't quite figure out why it's the national security section, but we have the news of Trump pardoning Arizona Sheriff Joe Apario, which I probably didn't say right, and I really don't care whether I say it right or not. But I think I'm going to push back a little on the hysteria around pardoning Joe Arpaio. Joe Arpaio is a longtime county sheriff who gained national fame and notoriety for his aggressive pursuit of undocumented immigrants. What I want to point out there real quick is that he is a county sheriff, an elected official based in through a democracy. And I'm getting this neoliberal modern idea again where I don't quite get how the liberal left-wing side of the ideas have suddenly made it that democracy is wrong, that, that uh, these things that used to be American staples and governments have, that they've leaned on have now become things that are the enemy, like being humane to one another and not punishing people. So he was following the rule of law, which was the pursuit of undocumented immigrants as an elected official. Yeah, but I mean, I would I would disagree with you there just to the extent that immigration law is not subject to local law enforcement, historically speaking. Right. Uh, there are certain areas of law in our constitutional system that are reserved explicitly to the federal government. And immigration has historically been one of them. And so when he was harassing undocumented immigrants, he was doing it outside the color of law as far as his specific role uh, and set of duties as a local sheriff. Yeah, I totally get that. And I'm not going to push back too hard 
on that concept, and I don't want to get too much into what he did and move over into the, the issues of, of pardoning him and what that means for all of us, mm. but all local officials, it, there's, there's a hierarchy. So federal officials cannot enforce state law. State officials cannot enforce um, local law. But all local law and, and up can enforce all of the things above it. So while local re- law enforcement is not tasked with doing immigration reform, by all means, they can do it. They can enforce any law up the chain of command that they want. The most powerful police is actually a local level officer just like this who, who can enforce all the laws going up. So when you are in Baltimore City, you can enforce every city ordinance, every state ordinance, every county, well, there's not a county in that case, and every federal ordinance. Going down, you cannot. So there is a little nuance there. <laughs> so let me get into the, to, to the history of this, though. So the surrounding idea is that we are, that this, is, this is in the front page of Washington News, Washington Post news going on like it's crazy and it's new, but sure. it's simply not. <laughs> They're comparing in this article that this compares to George Bush granting former Defense Secretary Casper Weinberger a pardon in 1992. This was over the Iran Can- Iran Cantor affair, Contra affair, where he. Was a, he was the Secretary of Defense, an appointed person who directly works for the president, went out and did illegal acts that were essentially would have been criminal acts of war and conspiracy on an international level. That does not compare to what Joe Arpario did. They also compare it to uh, President Clinton granting fugitive financier Mark Rich in 2001. But he hid from charges in Switzerland, was for tax evasion, and he made secret deals with Iran over oil while we were doing the hostage crisis. Where in the hell do we get that at a local sheriff a point following a law that is actually on the books and has only been given a pause to is remotely comparable to these other people? Well, I mean, to the extent that a federal court told Sheriff Joe Arpaio that his practices were in violation of civil rights law and he continued to engage in them anyway, he was not acting under color of law. And, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying in terms oh, of... that is arguable. No, no, no. Because I, and, and let me just go back. Like, I understand what you're saying in terms of uh, local officers having a sort of a wide array of laws that they can enforce but i i don't think it's accurate to say that all areas of federal law are enforceable by local police officers i think it's only certain areas where they have been given that legal right and authority but immigration is not historically one of those areas well i mean I, from a, from a local baltimore officer we now have uh immigration hits and terrorist hits and uh, warrant hits when that run through when you do NCIC things and you have a rating over whether you should hold somebody or not. And it's up to you, though. I mean, I don't know the local jurisdiction, but from my experience, everything I know, a local officer can enforce or at least detain. For no, definitely. Any violation of any law. And I think especially after 9-11, some of those powers have been expanded, you know, all the way up and down in terms of what people can do. And, and, and that's the whole essential uh, issue of whether people should hold or police departments should should agree to hold undocumented immigrants, even when their own internal policies or local laws wouldn't require them to do so if there's an ICE retainer. Right. And, and that's why right now local departments have the ability to say, no, we're not going to hold them because they're not actually required to follow those laws. They, they're given right. some discretion. Right, totally. So as a local sheriff who is serving his people in a democracy, I, I mean, I just think philosophically they have an argument. They have, he has a rational argument to what he's doing, especially since, like, look, I'm not trying to make him up for a good person. I just want to bear with these in the facts and not the fact that he's a complete asshole who's done, like, I would rather him been sent to prison 
over over putting people in pink uh, prison cell prison outfits in a slave labor camp that was living in tents in the desert. That makes sense. <laughs> You know, but but this stuff doesn't quite make sense. I want us to imagine if somebody on so-called our side of the fence would have done something that had a six-month sentence at max that was he could honestly have a rational argument for, for trying to do his job. And no. if somebody who since the age of 18 has been enlisted in the military, did it because of, of the Korean War, or at least claims that, did his time as a sheriff and served in, served the public through our, our objective measurements for 50 years, and he's 85 years old. If there's someone that we don't want to punish in our inhumane system of imprisonment and, and leaning on that as a sense of justice, I, I just feel like we're huge hypocrites Yeah, in, I mean, supposedly fighting for humanity. I, I, I don't deny that there is hypocrisy here. I would not argue that for a moment. However, I don't agree with your characterization of Sheriff Joe, especially because I think uh, his understanding of serving the public meant serving a very specific swath of the public. I think that largely meant serving a white public. I'm not exactly sure because he was a county sheriff. So I don't know if this is one of those situations where the city is in a county where it doesn't necessarily control its own destiny, right? Like if only Phoenix voters were voting, maybe he wouldn't have been sheriff, but the ability of other areas around plus Phoenix enabled him to, to have a grasp. But I think, you know, his practices really spoke to a, a, a failure of equal protection, which is a basic uh, premise, I think, of any system of law that is going to work, right? There has to be equal protection of the law. And he was clearly just targeting Latinos. He wasn't targeting European immigrants who might have overstayed their visa, for example. And so in all of these things, the fact that he was trying to enforce federal laws, which he does not actually have authority to enforce, and the fact that he was not applying the law equally across the board are all examples of ways in which he was not actually serving the public. He was serving the public as he construed it in his own image, which was essentially white. And so I, I, I don't think that he was a good actor. I think he acted beyond the color of law. I think the conviction was valid. Uh, he gets pardoned, so he's not going to get his slap on the wrist, which was all that conviction was anyway. But I think the, the bigger issue here is, one, what does this say about equal protection? of the law, especially in the age of Trump. And especially, you know, in, in, in our podcast, we've had this conversation about what does justice mean? And I think in a lot of ways, you've defined justice as equal protection. I, I don't think there's any argument that can be made that Sheriff Joe applied the law equally in any sense of that word. And so, but I do think the hypocrisy enters, just like you said, that this is a person who was elected over and over and over again. And I think that there's just a certain extent to which race and issues of, of racism have to be dealt with at the social level and not strictly at the policy or political or legal levels. Yeah, I don't have any pushback on what you're saying there. Other than we, I'm not going to say we like we're special, but <laughs> we make an argument that this isn't a democracy. And at least I make an argument that democracies don't work. But our society makes this argument that we should be doing things in a democratic fashion. And this is a great example of how we should not be doing things <laughs> in a democratic fashion, that we are a republic for a reason, and that is to provide equal protection under the law. But that's not what we actually do and we push for, which is like my biggest problem isn't in this situation, it's in the narrative crafted around the situation. Whereas, like, I totally agree with you that he wasn't a good actor. But I, I feel like we're missing again that he is a product of what America has been for the last 60 years. This is what we created in our institutions. And so, again, we are blaming an individual and not and totally missing the actual big picture that matters when we have. Uh, when we need equal democracy, we, we are saying that law is, is this measure right now. 
But law is a terrible measure of morality and what we should be doing is good. When the ACLU jumps up and says Trump has chosen lawlessness over justice, division over unity, and hurt over healing, what he's doing is legal. I don't understand what you're saying. What, how do we say that we lean on that, that one thing is lawless and we must have a lawful society and criticize someone when they're doing something that's legal? I don't understand what, we're, what these arguments are. No, I mean, I think that's fair. I mean, clearly the uh, the power to pardon is in Trump's hands. And so there is no question that what that what Trump did was legal, though. I do think there's a critique that his action undermines the idea of the rule of law to the extent that it forgives someone who failed to apply the law equally. And when the law is not applied equally, then the rule of law becomes something very arbitrary and very quickly devolves into purely a tool of power, right? If, if the law only protects certain people, but not others, and is not applied equally, then it really, at that point, only has an oppressive function. And so, in that sense, I do think Trump, with his actions, sort of codified a principle of, it doesn't matter whether we follow the law equally. What matters is whether the law is used as a bludgeon by white people against non-white people. Uh, and so I think the critique of the action itself is fair. I, I think so in isolation. And the problem is, is we're not in isolation. So right now in front of me, I have President Barack Obama's 2009 to 2017 pardon. Okay. Sure. Now, this is conspiracy to defraud the United States government, conspiracy to embezzle, mail fraud, misrepresentation of civil citizenship, bank embezzlement, bank fraud, conspiracy to launder money, mail fraud, bank, uh, false entry to a bank, interstate transportation of property obtained by fraud, unlawful disposal of hazardous waste, because officer conduct become, unbecoming of an officer, to willfully make and subscribe a false federal income tax, health care fraud, theft of government property, evade income taxes, conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine, dispo knowingly disposing of a firearm to a person convicted of a felony, bank fraud. I mean, these lists go on and on of offenses wildly more harmful to national issues and national security. But we're bringing these things up merely because of these de these divisive lines that, that we've all done to turn on to one another because we have a, a government that creates these classes and makes us want to fight over one another. And so now we're all sitting here talking about whether Trump is, is denigrating the law of American society by pardoning Sheriff Joe Apario when every single president has been doing this, when every single government has been doing this, and every agency of policing around this country is doing some version of this right now. No, yeah, and, and you know, the, the basic idea of the pardon, I mean, there's no question you're right. Both sides of the aisle, Democrat, Republican, since that's all we can really talk about in terms of our current presidential politics, both sides pardon, and they pardon on the basis of their own values, right? There are persons that a Barack Obama would pardon that a Republican, even just a traditional Republican, putting Trump aside, would never, ever, ever, ever pardon. And likewise, there are persons that a George W. Bush uh, would, would pardon, Scooter Libby, but that a Democrat would never pardon. And so th there's no question that both sides use the pardon. I do think you can argue that Trump's particular pardon... Uh, you know, violates the spirit of the rule of law, or at least the, the idea of the equal protection of law. But there's no question that pardoning anyone in that sense undermines the rule of law because all of them have broken some law or another. And that's the entire premise of the pardon. You can't pardon people who haven't back broken to laws. Those two people, though, Roberto, that I mentioned at the very beginning, who were making international conspiracies with Iran. That's who Clinton pardoned. No, I mean, like, there's no question. I mean, that, that I hear like equal protection under the law. I mean, I can't believe like I don't know. I, I don't want to get too tracked on that. But no, I think uh, I no, the, I think your point is fair. I think your point is fair that uh, if the if it's if 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 it's just a question of whether the pardoning itself undermines the rule of law, I think no, of course not, because it is itself a legal process. However, yeah, and let me, uh, yeah, let me do my last one before you sure. do that real quick. 
Vanta Gupta, who is the chief executive of the Leadership Council on Civil Rights and Human Rights, and we know that name in Baltimore for dealing with the DOJ is there. Yeah, she used to be the head of the Civil Rights Division uh, of the Justice Department under uh, Obama. Right. And then has stated that this was a violation of rule of law, and it does not respect the rule of law. So, I I mean, I don't know. What is worse? Like, the head of the... The, the, the civil rights person doing this and, and like setting this entire seed that the rule of law is actually what we agree with, not what the law is, and that we should be leaning on to the law, and that the vast punishment for this and what we should do is still turn to a system that we know is unjust and maintain us into a punishment mindset. That, that's just still my, my big thing. The idea that justice comes from punishing other human beings as long as it's a, ones that we think are the enemies like this is that whole whether we're going to fight to become the to end oppression or become the oppressors and how we see that word of justice being revenge plus equality and that is a terrible definition of justice yeah especially because the equality part doesn't really work right like uh if if, murder is the most obvious example right like somebody can't be unmurdered so (laughs) oh my god right so never phrased it that way that is so good how could you have so you can get revenge for the murder right but it's never going to be you're never balancing out what happened right especially to the extent that you probably don't weigh the victim and the perpetrator on the same level in every instance there's never going to be that sort of balancing back to an equal state so really all we're left with is revenge you know justice I think, practically speaking, not in terms of how we conceive it, but what in its actual operation is little more than the power of the state. I I, I really don't think we can have a practical definition that is more than that, because when you look at the way the rule of law has played out over time, and I think the Arpaio pardon is a good example, right? It has nothing to do with any broader principle than what this state is able to do through its own authority and power. That's it. That's as far as it goes. And then we appeal to this notion, hoping that it'll bring us something like morality when it's not ever going to do that because it's not a moral concept to begin with. And so redefining it might make it that, but it's not that currently. It has not been that historically. And even if people at times have spoken of it in elegant, poetic ways and asserted that it was this important principle, there, there, there is no thing called justice that you can appeal to that has a real world effect, right? You can't, when something bad happens, you can't be like, hey, justice, fix this. This shouldn't have happened. No, because it's just a word we say to dress up the violence of the state in the color of law. And so justice is is inevitably, from a practical standpoint, just what the law allows. And in this case, what the law allows is for Trump to pardon Joe Arpaio. Yeah, I love that you just pointed that out. I don't know where you pulled that from, but let me refer to, uh, I put out an article that I hope everybody will read, kind of getting more into civilian life policing and the foundations of why I think these discussions are are misleading to our real issues. But the the scholar that I lean on all the time was an Enlightenment guy from Italy named Cesar Beccaria in the late 1700s. He said, we should be cautious how we associate the word justice as being any idea of a real thing, such as physical power or a being that actually exists. So in the late 1700s, he was kind of getting up to that idea that you've brought into a modern context that is justice actually a thing other than this kind of notion we can float out in the space and fighting over what it really is, is a distraction because it, it, it's something that isn't really, it, it's smoke and mirrors. No, it, it's utterly smoke and mirrors. And I, you know, I, I don't have, it, it's, I don't think it's a useful exercise to go into now, but when you just understand like the structure of the term justice and where it comes from linguistically and, and its relationship to certain other concepts, then I think you have a clear understanding that justice is little more than what the law allows. That's all that the word refers to. And, you know, one of the areas in which I first started to sort of 
developed this idea is when I was in law school and I was writing a paper on the legal basis for the establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, you know, which led into all sorts of history of the church and the papal bulls given to the Spanish and Portuguese crowns to colonize in the New World, and then the claims later made by the English to justify their uh, expansion into the quote-unquote New World territories. And what you realize over time uh, is that the only real basis for uh, being able to assert control over a territory was very much that in and of itself, that you were in effect controlling that territory. So if you weren't in a position to inflict violence on anybody who made a claim against that land you also claimed was yours, then you really couldn't be said to hold it in any meaningful way, right? You might make a claim on paper, but at the end of the day, countries held the territories that they could defend and nothing else. And when you just look at the practical situation, there's really no greater principle than that. Where violence could effectively turn back any challenge, then somebody had a, a, a legal claim. And that's really all it came down to. And so at some point, all law is, is what the violence of the state can enforce. And that's it. it there's no greater moral authority or concept or guide to which law or justice adhere or or pay allegiance you know i really thought it was just a policing issue when i would look at these cases and you would see that the the narrative was crafted first and mm. then the evidence that fit that narrative is what is considered okay let me that's can... just simply not a policing thing is it <laughs> no but you know i i, I I'm, I'm gonna go into the weeds here just a little bit and then um I think we, we, we should continue with this discussion in the next episode. But I think the problem we have in the West is that our, our concept of rationality has always produced circular reasoning. And the reason for that is that when you, when you, when you look at the history of thought in the West, almost every movement or... Uh, philosophical idea or theoretical position begins from the conclusion, right? And so um, you might ask a question like, why is why are humans rational? But at that point, you've already decided that humans are rational. And now you're creating uh, an account of why they're rational. And so inevitably, you're left with this circular account because you started from the conclusion. If you start from the conclusion, then work your way back to the conclusion, you're always going to end up with circular logic. And so we end up in these positions where we're all convinced that we know something because we created an argument to defend a conclusion we already had. And then by doing that and creating that circle, we essentially unwall ourselves and outside information and perspectives just can't get in because we, we've created an entire logical or rational apparatus around a conclusion we already knew was true. We just needed to provide the evidence. And that version of rationality still predominates in our discourse, right? And that's why people always say, I'm just being rational. And really all they're saying is, I'm just confirming the thing that I already knew to be true. Because rationality in that context will always, always, always be measured from the person themselves, not from any other external metric. So it can never really be objective in the way that we've talked about it. The only reason we think rationality is, is, it provides something objective is because we continue to claim it does, uh, despite the fact that it never has actually operated that way. Which is kind of mind-blowing when you really think about it. And, and what we are doing even in science and in, in common thought when we have these ideas of wanting to be right. Mm. And whenever you do something right, you only confirmed that circular logic that you knew how to turn on the computer properly and start up Microsoft Word. You didn't advance computing. You didn't mm. advance intelligence. You didn't advance the field of, of word processing in any way, shape, or form. Whenever we do something right and we have this goal, like we have to do this right and we have to succeed at this, but you do no growth whenever you are just trying to do what you already know how to do. Well, and I think the way you, 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 you structured it illustrates perfectly why we end up in the same places, right? Because 
you said we need to do this right which means that you already have a definition of right like you already know what the outcome is supposed to be you know what it's supposed to look like and maybe there are some details that you know you're not you, you're not necessarily saying it has to be this or that but th th there's a framework there that already determines what the outcome should be before you've even started to do the work of figuring out how we start to address the issue right even in the identification of a problem that we say needs to be addressed the, the, the assumption is that this is indeed a problem, right? We didn't necessarily do a study and then decide that, oh, indeed, uh, it turns out this is a problem. Now we have to figure out how to address it. We've already decided it needs to be addressed. And so the, the, we're always kind of starting from the conclusion instead of from the premise. The last thing I wanted to get into this episode before we devolve down those ideas that we were going on a second ago is to clarify the rule of law in what the standards for consideration of clemency is or uh, petitions for the pardons. So it's Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1 of the United States Constitution, the Pardon Clause, and Executive Order dated June 16, 1893, transfers the clemency petitioning process to the Justice Department. And I think this executive order that transfers the processing to the Justice Department is where we've gotten these ideas of what clemency and, and uh, pardons actually mean. So in this proceduring, the general matter of rule is that you're supposed to be considered guilty of this offense and you should have already served five years in prison before these things come up. And what is influencing the decision from the Department of Justice is good conduct for a substantial period of time after the conviction and service of at least those five years, and that the petitioner submit things up to the Department of Justice and they'll consider things like their post conviction conduct and reputation, the seriousness of the offense, the acceptance of responsibility for, for the actions, the need for relief of somebody and the recommendations from officials. So even if we go by rule of law, or actually rule of procedure here, mm. what we could only be saying is that we haven't waited the five years or something like that in here, because I mean, post-conviction relief and character and reputation, yeah, I mean, and he's not going to pass that bar very well. <laughs> well, he <laughs> but, might in in, the, in a Trump Justice Department, but but you exactly. Know. So then you have the official recommendations of reports of who is duly elected in our republic democracy here, and and that's so that's going to be enough of a recommendation by any policy or procedure if that comes from the top. Yeah, um, but, you need the relief. I mean, dude's eighty five. I. Come on, he's out of office. He's not going to be able to do any harm. Our idea of punishment is supposed to be to protect society from the harm that that person would do. I don't see how they can continue that he could continue that harm in this case. Acceptance of responsibility. I don't think how he could have accepted responsibility anymore. He's like, I did this. You told me no, and I'm going to continue to do this. So, yeah, I mean, so we have a lot of these things in place that were actually within the procedures and within the laws that are established. We're just not doing the Justice Department rules because the president is stepping in and saying this is fine, which a lot of probably every president has done. I, mean, I haven't gone back and traced them all. No, yeah, but from from Bush and on. A, a pardon under the Constitution doesn't require any process really beyond uh, the president making a decision, and so the fact that executive level rules have been put in place to maybe guide the process or to make it a little bit more orderly doesn't mean that the executive him or herself can't step outside of that process right like that doj process is essentially something that they set up under the executive and under the legal authority that the executive has under the constitution to set up uh, such rules and processes to, to make this process a little bit more orderly, right? Because any number of people might be like, hey, pardon me, give me clemency, whatever. Uh, and so it helps to have an actual process. Um, you know, you might say that this helps uh, lend certain validity to the justice system because there's a formal process where, where persons who have been incarcerated or convicted can appeal to the mercy of an executive. But the constitution doesn't require any process beyond 
simply the president making a decision. So there's no question that the, the rule of law is not implicated by the pardon itself. The question of the rule of law might be implicated depending on where you stand by who was pardoned and, and what actions were pardoned. But like you pointed out, you can't have a pardon unless someone has violated the law. So to the extent, you know, the entire idea of the pardon is, is, is a mercy concept, right? It's the idea that a, a, the executive should have the ability to say you deserve mercy. And, and, and putting aside the question of whether we think Sheriff Joe deserves mercy, which is not the relevant metric, right? It's not, if Mike and Roberto agree that somebody deserves mercy, then the president should pardon them. That's really solely at the discretion of the president. And in this case, our president is Trump and he has pardoned this individual. And I, I, w I would propose that that is the key point, that it isn't, this isn't a violation of the rule of law. And my main proposal would be that this narrative that this destroys the rule of law is what really harms society and gets us sidetracked.